Thanks for that. And uh, it's great to have this opportunity. Good evening to everybody um, I'm from Paris, where I've been spending most of the pandemic period. Um, and OK, so I'm going to kick it off with this first slide. I have about 20 slides. And then at the end of it, I have one of the slides is actually a short video, hopefully to make us all smile. So bear with me during the 20 slides or so. Um, so the first slide is just to um, lay out the question which uh, which Jakub and, and I and a lot of us, I think, in this conversation have been, you know, trying to get our brains around, you know, um, how is it that with this um, increasingly intercontin interconnected uh, you know, continent of ours, uh, there is still no obvious pan-European media space. And there, there's lots of beautiful journalism, um, but there, is, there, there isn't that, that, that initiative or that place that you think, okay, this is, this is where, you know, I can feel that I'm part of this wider uh, continental community in all its complexity. Um, so that's the that's the big uh, it's a big question mark and ne next slide is is um, about um, what what do we mean by a pan European or even you know pan European space um, I don't know if you can yeah so this is thanks Jakub so this is um, this is my answer and I think you know we can just it's it's something we can endlessly discuss but my answer would be okay it's the it's the it's the continent uh, the wider continent. Um, and it is not limited to the EU or to uh, any uh, separate institution. Uh, it is a human space. And, uh, you know, UN statistics say that this is, a, this is a space of 740 million people. So that includes Russia. But as you know, Russia, most of Russia's population is on this side of the, Ur the Urals. Um, and so the so definition is, as, as Julie pointed out, and as was also used during the Summer of Solidarity pro Project, the definition is the Council of Europe, you know, anybody living, any, any person living on this wider continent, uh, whatever their passport, whatever their citizenship, um, uh, but who happens to be, you know, spending some time or living uh, in this space formed by the Council of Europe member states and Belarus, a country that was kicked out of the Council of Europe, but that's our defining, you know, that's our sort of starting definition. Um, and the next slide is about, is basically, it's, um, it's, it kind of, I try to boil down some things that have been pretty, pretty much obsessing me. And I'm, I'm a person from the legacy media, the, the quote unquote legacy media. It's where I spent most of my, you know, all of my career. And I, I, I started working as a journalist right after the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, I was still a student, but those were my first uh, jobs, my first freelance uh, articles. And I, I, I've come to the conclusion that, um, you know, even as I worked in a fairly European um, uh, mindset, you know, I started, I worked most of my career in the French media and different newspapers, and I moved to The Guardian in 2014. I speak English like this because I partly grew up in London and then in Canada, and I've traveled far and wide across Europe. And I think of myself, you know, at the grand old age of 50, almost 55, I think of myself as a, as a French European or, you know, a continental European. And uh, it seems to me that media, beautiful legacy media, and again, I love them. I've, I've worked for several of them. Um, don't do the trick. They don't do the trick in terms of really helping us uh, see beyond certain silos. And I, I try to summarize that in, in, these, in these two paragraphs. Uh, I'll, let, I'll leave it there. Um, I, you know, essentially, uh, we need more. And so the, indeed, the next slide is, is, um, is, is raising the question of, you know, do some media organizations who do reach across, do they quite cut it? Do they quite reach that uh, dimension of being the, 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 the sort of European you know, picture that we would feel is, is rich enough, full enough and diverse enough. And uh, so I've, I've summarized them in three categories and this is not any, in any way uh, you know, exhaustive. This isn't a, a sort of, you know, uh, not everybody is mentioned here, right? Um, so you have media organizations uh, that are, you know, extremely uh, high quality and prestigious, and they do cut across 
Europe, and they, uh, uh, but they, they consider themselves as global rather than pan-European. I've, I've, that's my impression we can discuss, but that's kind of where I've landed on that question. Um, you have, um, and those are the top ones I put on the on this slide. You have um, media organizations that, from from the start, uh, labeled themselves as as European. You know, Arte is is Franco-German, but the the E in Arte means European. Um, but it is nevertheless still Franco-German. You know, in, in in its governance, certainly. Um, and uh, like Euronews, it comes from the 1990s, which isn't, you know, a problem in itself, but it, they have an issue, they have a, a, a challenge, I suppose, to cast themselves as something that's fresh and new. And a lot of people are working on that, and I know they're doing great stuff, but uh, they don't quite yet reach that point where they're the obvious place to go. And as far as Euronews is concerned, uh, there have been, you know, there's an ownership issue um, with Euronews. Uh, which I think raises important question marks. Uh, I can return to that later if you want. And the final, the smaller uh, category, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful uh, digital, digital uh, only media. Um, but as I, I would, you know, I guess we would agree to say that they mostly essentially um, put their energy into covering the Brussels bubble. You know, um, that's that's where I would I would. Um, uh, you know, that's how I would qualify them. The next slide is, um, is you know, a little sort of attention, attention point. Um, when we talk about, you know, when we talk about Europe, we talk, of course, as a, of a continent. Um, and it's a wide space. Uh, it's a complex place, uh, just as the US is, for example. And we, we've heard a lot about polarization uh, in the US. Um, uh, in, in recent years, but I think that in, I think we're all aware that when it comes to Europe, um, there needs to be a special, you know, a special attention put on our vulnerabilities as a continent, uh, uh, because of our history, uh, and because of some of the darker sides, which we've seen, you know, at times creeping back up. And I think that there is, it is something that, um, that the media space needs to address in a, in a new way. Um, and I think pan-European pan media thinking is, is an interesting answer to that problem. I just pasted one photo, which you know, is meant to illustrate that, the question of vaccine nationalism. Europe is, on, is in the middle of you know, an incredible, incredible crisis. Um, no need to detail um, any of this, you all know about it. But I, I, you know, I think that we we will have a challenge with, you know, how the question of how we relate to each other across this continent in the wake of this uh, ongoing crisis, uh, economic and pandemic, etc. Um, the next, uh, the next slide is is a flashback, um, almost thirty years back. Um, there was a, a European newspaper, so it was a paper newspaper. It was launched in uh, 1990 by Robert Maxwell, who was um, a British media mogul, and it lasted uh, several years, um, but it's, I, I kind of, I always find it very touching to look back at what, what they did. Um, uh, it, it, it kind of always struggled, and, uh, but it did, it did cast itself as, you know, in the words of Robert Maxwell, Europe's national newspaper. I don't think any of us who think about you know, pan-European media initiatives would call any of them a, a Europe's national, you know, media outlet today. Um, uh, and in, in essence, the European, uh, which interestingly enough, a few years ago had a kind of follow-up with the new European in the UK after Brexit, um, the European was in essence a British newspaper, you know, wanting to be European. Um, um, so that's the little flashback and then jump to today with the, with the next slide and I, I try to um, just you know give some visibility to some, not all, uh, not all, but some um, of the kind of new players um, that we have in, in Europe and that there are different you know different outlets or initiatives or collaborative um, projects. Uh, they can be investigative, they can be storytelling. 
And there, none of them, you know, uh, hardly any of them existed uh, if only, what, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, I think that's fair to say. Um, so there is creativity and it's clear that there's, you know, there's a quest. There's, there's something that we're looking for. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's, the, that's the subject, right? How to, and the next slide is about one of the dimensions. The next slide is also to paste more logos of interesting, you know, uh, initiatives and also outlets. Um, uh, what's interesting about them is that there's an, a special effort uh, put into reaching across, reaching across boundaries, reaching across all sorts of boundaries, cultural, national borders, uh, um, you know, social. Um, there's, um, I won't go into all the details. We can, you know, if there are any questions afterwards, I'm happy to discuss and some of them who are on the slide as you as you can see there's the fix because I think that's uh, a, clearly a new player on on the European scene and I I, I was really excited when I met Jakub uh, what, was, what was it a year and a half ago uh, the fix was you know uh, launched and getting you know gearing up and I think it's been doing great work and later on in this web in this discussion we're going to hear from Paul about forum.eu and there are all sorts of other initiatives and, and Hannah is going to talk about Europe talks or my country talks. So all these things are about, it's, just, it's you know, before we even get to the question of business models and, you know, everything that troubles uh, all of us in the media business world, um, I think it's important to talk about the spirit of what we're doing, you know, the spirit of this kind of new spirit that, that I think there is a potential to tap into. And it's about cross-border, collaborative, engagement, solutions, it's investigative. It's also about depolarizing. Um, and I added at the bottom of this slide, I added to the bottom right, I added more in common, which is not as such a media organization, but it's, uh, it's an organization that works to try to you know, bridge gaps. And I think this is this is, this is the exciting dimension that we can explore when we're talking about a uh, pan-European pan -European media space. Uh, the, next, the next slide is, um, is I try to list, you know, what, what do pan-European media uh, initiatives or journalism do best? So I, I listed, I tried to list them. Um, um, and I, you know, if I had to say one, what, 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 what to me is the kind of key thing, uh, I, I would say connect dots. They connect dots in ways that others don't quite. Um, uh, and the, the, also an important thing which came up in a previous uh, discussion that the FIX organized is the notion of unbiasing the news, you know, uh, to be diversity designed is an interesting notion. Um, what that means in this case is that you're not you're not talking about a national media organization that suddenly wants to branch out into a wider European dimension. You're talking about an initiative uh, that from from the start says we are you know we are building ourselves. We are uh, networking something which is from the start. Uh, cross European. Um, it, it's not one strictly national uh, outlet that goes beyond its borders. It's it's from the get go uh, a, a pan European approach. Um, so of course, next slide is uh, yes. You know all these are nice words, but you know what about scale? What about funding, revenues, uh, leveraging a network? When I um, I'm this this talk that I'm giving this you know modestly giving to you right, right now is not about providing you know the the template, the exact answer to all these questions, but of course they're they're grueling questions. And when I discussed some of this with, with people that I met over the last you know, months or so, um, one expression that came up was, well, you know, pan-European media initiatives or, or outlets look like a forest of bonsais. You know, they're all so small and they're, and they're, they're struggling to grow. Um, so the notion of a forest of bonsais is kind of stuck in my mind. So I pasted a bonsai. Um, the, the next, the next slide is about um, one of the, you know, one of the scenarios that, that, that we all know about um, for, for funding. And I guess this slide is essentially to just point out that, uh, yes, you know, philanthropy and nonprofit 
uh, uh, is is definitely something to be explored and is happening. Um, but um, as Europeans or as people in Europe, we have to remember that the 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 the, the potential for philanthropy funding and nonprofit. Uh, is is much much smaller in Europe as than it is in the U.S. Um, and I mean there are many reasons for this, um, but as as one uh, study pointed out, which I I allude to at the bottom, which is the media impact funders, and also the European Journalism Center has written about this. Uh, one of the reasons is that Europe has a, has a tradition and a, a, a legacy of, of public funded broadcasters, right? Since the Second World War, they, there were a lot of money and resources were put into creating that, you know, reliable media space for people through public broadcasting, public funded broadcasting. And, and that, that was never really the case in the US. So uh, it's not that Europe is, you know, uh, not active in funding its media, uh, I mean, governments or the public sector, or it's just that the, the philanthropy never had to fill a role, you know, to fulfill something that the, that the public side wasn't doing. Uh, the next, the next slide is um, is the is, and I really encourage you to look at this report by Alexander Fanta from the Otto Brenner, Brenner Foundation. Uh, it's uh, it's titled "Google the Media Patron," and what he did was he looked into uh, a number of European uh, media scenes, and uh, and and what Google has been you know up to with with uh, with European media, and specifically in Germany, he looked at Germany specifically. And um, one you know we, I remember a discussion I had with with somebody from from another Silicon Valley a giant who told me this was a year and a half ago, who told me, um, oh, the only innovation that's happening in European media is is Google funded. And that was that was, you know, uh, in the context of the of the digital news initiative. And uh, but this this is this is uh, this is an issue, isn't it? I mean, that, you know, that we have in Europe relied so much on money uh, trickling down from Google. And one thing that is interesting in this report, and this is the quote that I've put in the, in the slide, is that, uh, is that actually Google's funding, um, it's not just PR work for Google. Of course, it's PR work for Google, but it's also a business strategy for Google. Um, and it's a resistance to, to you know, certain regulation uh, efforts. Um, but the, the interesting thing that came jumped up at me was that the funding actually worsens economic disparities uh, among media outlets and in Europe. And uh, an over, uh, you know, an overarching, you know, a wide uh, majority of funds from Google actually go to established, you know, old legacy media. They don't go. The, these funds don't go to startups or local outlets. Uh, uh, they hardly benefit. This is the This is the conclusion that this study uh, has come to, and that's interesting because, as we know, there's not an over lot of transparency in how this you know how this money actually um actually is used and under what conditions um so you know uh i'm not saying that nobody should take money from any of these silicon valley giants i'm when when we innovate i'm just saying that we have to be increasingly aware of the questions that come with that and we have to discuss this more and um uh and and i think that you know just uh, they won't they won't I don't think that they will be very forthcoming in terms of you know helping pump up a pan-european uh, media space uh, it's not in their interest that would be my hunch my my next slide is about um, uh, about what 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 is the EU up to okay so the EU uh, I'll keep this short the EU has increased its funding for journalism and um, uh, uh, but there are all sorts of, you know, uh, troubles and headaches attached to that. Um, and I don't see uh, so far, you know, I may I may be proven wrong in, in but so far I don't see any kind of striking, you know, uh, obvious pan-European media initiative coming out of this or being carried, you know, forth by the EU. There's all sorts of stuff happening. Uh, there's also uh, collaboration and cooperation and alliances among public broadcasters. 
But again, these big beasts, you know, the public broadcasters, they, they tend to, to play their cards in a very national centric way. Um, and one little thing I wanted to throw in here is that the 61 million euros, which the EU through this uh, Creative Europe um, budget line uh, is, is preparing to, you know, uh, to uh, allocate uh, in this current budget, the EU current budget, which has started and will run until 2027, is um, yes, it's you know it's not a negligible amount of money that's for sure, but it's not like humongous. It isn't. Um, uh, just to to give you one item of comparison, the EU uh, the EU EU funds uh, go to Euronews, which is no longer European owned. Uh, they go to Euronews and they have done until at least last year uh, to uh, the amount of 24 million euros per year. So actually when you compare, you know, what goes to Euronews, which doesn't fully, fully qualify as a pan-European uh, media right now uh, because of its ownership st structure, um, uh, that's, that's like a huge chunk, you know, compared to, I mean, it's, it's almost two thirds of what the EU is preparing to hand out to, to the media. Um, in this current budget um, period. I'll stop there on, on that. Um, there, the next slide is about the question of, is there political will for, for anything that would really, you know, bring that, that um, gist, that, that humph to a pan-European uh, media spirit. And uh, I, I decided to, you know, just quote uh, one declaration. It's in, the, in a treaty that Merkel and Macron signed in, in 2019, early 2019. And the expression there is, you know, um, to create a common, uh, common cultural and media space, a common media space. So this is between the French and German, but, you know, the thinking is, uh, uh, the thinking is, you know, if you if you can do it at, at a Franco-German level, eventually you can, you know, hopefully pitch it to to the rest of the club. Um, so far, I haven't seen anything transformative. I know things are happening, but I haven't seen anything transformative. And this goes to the problem of, you know, can this be a top-down political uh, endeavor? And I'm not sure. Um, and the next slide is what I find more the more interesting approach, which is um, the grassroots approach. And, you know, media and journalism and journalists are thinking about this and searching for, you know, potential in this pan-European media space, you know, uh, innovative media. Uh, but citizens haven't been waiting. You know, we've seen this in recent years. And of course, these pictures are pre-COVID. But I was really, really struck, you know, in recent years uh, at the, the degree of uh, grassroots movements that have echoed across the continent. Um, uh, you know, anti-corruption uh, protests or, you know, efforts, civic, civic activism in that direction, the climate uh, mobilization, um, debates about women's rights, uh, you know, um, uh, LGBT uh, discussions, the Black Lives Matter debate last, last summer. All, this, all of this points to uh, the fact that, to the reality of a transcontinental debate, which, um, you know, and look at how the, the fight for, you know, freedom in some countries, like in a country like Belarus, or, you know, the, the aspirations of people in Ukraine, how these things can resonate elsewhere in Europe today. And it, our continent has become wider and our awareness of common uh, debates and issues is, is bigger, I believe. And so that, that spells, that kind of creates a backdrop for uh, a, a new way of doing, you know, pan-European, uh, uh, creating a pan-European media space. Uh, the next slide is, um, is you know how I tend to look at Europe. Maybe maybe I'm you know maybe you won't agree, but I see Europe as uh, as a, a network of urban hubs and the people and places in between. So I don't at all from, I don't at all negate the national dimension. I see the national dimension as part of Europe's diversity. Like there are other dimensions to Europe's diversity. There are all sorts of diversities, and I think our identities can be plural. Uh, we're not solely defined by one aspect of our identity. So I'm interested in this sort of network of urban hubs. And I think that is, uh, you know, that is where the potential lies for a, a pan-European uh, media space. 
in particular. Uh, next slide is about the our lingua franca. So um, we're, you know, we're. Uh, I'm, I suppose many people listening to this are from different different countries, different linguistic backgrounds, cultures. Well, we're all doing this in, in English, and it's it's you know the word the, the language we we function in, and um, the when you look at the statistics of how English has been spreading over the last 20, 15, 10 years, it's pretty spectacular. It doesn't mean everybody speaks or reads English, of course, in Europe, but we have this lingua franca. Let's let's make better. Let's make as much use of it as we can. And while I say that, I, I don't mean that everything has to be in English. We again, you know, a pan-European media space has to be pluralistic and diverse in its in its languages as well. But um, I, I do believe that the spread of English, um, which, which in a way, you know, ironically, I mean, ironically, it's like the, the fact that we can have this conversation tonight and, and that so many other conversations are happening across Europe in English, uh, especially with the younger generation is like the, the this, you know, immense gift that was left by uh, US and UK soft power across Europe. You know, globalization in Europe has been, uh, Europeani Europeanization also. Um, the next slide is a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a little statistic. It's from 20, 2018, and it's, it's just about, you know, this distinction between attachment to the EU and attachment to Europe. And when you look at those statistics, you see that, you know, Europeans, when you ask Europeans, uh, they're, um, you know, you can see on the left-hand side that they're more attached to their country and their city, town, or village than to anything else if they're asked, you know, to list their priority. But it's interesting, isn't it, that Europe on the right-hand side, uh, this is an average, um, triggers a sense of attachment, 65% uh, of, of Europeans, these were EU uh, people, um, whereas the EU uh, triggers only 43% of, of that expression of attachment. So I, I think this is also where there is um, an opening for uh, a pan-European media space, not precisely by making clear that it's not about, it's not about, you know, the EU or its institutions or just its, you know, its Power, power struggles. Um, the next slide is I. I. I um, I've, this is this the the first the top part of the slide is what uh, Frédéric Fillou, who who's um, a French journalist who spent some time at Stanford and and writes the Monday note. Maybe some of you know know this note. And he asked uh, last year in the middle of the pandemic, uh, the first first part of the pandemic, he asked. A young, a series of young people, like his students in different countries, uh, what how they saw a post-COVID media. You know what what they thought it would be like and what it should be like. And these are the words that I've pasted are some of the you know answers that they gave. And I think this kind of dr gives us the, the kind of you know uh, roadmap in a way when 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 thinking about you know what a pan-European media space. Uh, should be or could be. These are the words, right? Lightweight, the, the, the uh, decentralized public interest, embracing and explaining complexity. And at the bottom, bottom hand of the slide, I, I wrote down my thoughts at this point, which is, which are, you know, for specifically for pan-European media space or, uh, or, or uh, initiative, that it, it has to be multi-channel. It has to go where the public is. It's not a one trick pony. So, Basically, you know, like Woody Allen once says, once said, whatever works. You know, you go where, where you can, you you bring your your you 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 bring your content or your initiative where people are. Um, you don't wait for them to come to you. Um, uh, and that's that may sound banal, but I think it's especially important in a, in if you're thinking about a pan-European dimension, collaborative, uh, networked, perhaps a network of networks. Uh, but definitely collaborative, not nothing highly centralized. Uh, pop-up, Julie mentioned this earlier. I'm in love with the idea of pop-up. I think that there's something that can, you know, maybe you can, we can imagine something that's a, a sort of flexible, adaptable structure or network that can mobilize or be mobilized for pop-up uh, projects that tap into debates and questions or issues that, that matter to people and, and that engage people while they do this. 
And as I, I've been very, very brief on the on the revenue and funding side, um, no silver bullet. I don't see a silver bullet there. I think it's probably going to be a combination of things. Um, but I'm I'm under little doubt, and this is my next slide. I'm under little doubt that this is actually going to happen. That I, <laughs> you know, for all the doom and gloom that we're hearing, um, I see I feel positive vibes about this. Um, I, I think there is a momentum, um, and it's there's a there's a, a growing awareness. Uh, you know, there's going to be more talk about this. There are going to be failures. There's there going to be trials and you know attempts. There's certainly a new generation um, that thinks within and across national silos, and that is hungry for that kind of thinking, in, especially in Europe. Um, and then on the tech side, you know. We know that new technology is coming also in, in terms of, you know, translating instant translation quality stuff. I'm not saying it's like a, a miracle about to happen, but there is a good tech uh, phenomenon to be to be tapped into. Um, and and we can think about this as Europeans, you know, um, uh, we don't want to be, you know, using tech the way, you know, the Chinese regime is using it. Let's say let's say things things that way. Um, the next slide is, and I'm also, I'm almost wrapping up. The next slide is um, basically it's all up for grabs. It's all to play for, but I do see some, some traps or things that, you know, um, difficulties or the, you know, concerns that we should have. Um, again, um, beware of doing something that is, that is labeled cross European or, but in fact, it's just a, a, a sort of outgrowth or, Annex to something which is essentially nation centric. You know, um, again, uh, if, if something can take off, it has to be. It has to have that cross European dimension from the start. Um, the EU, I think, I think the EU has a responsibility in providing some funding for something uh, meaningful and perhaps more ambitious. Um, but of course, there's going to be a, there would be an issue with you know. Uh, governance uh, and uh, avoiding and protecting the project from appearing to be, you know, evil EU controlled, EU controlled. And, you know, we can never say it enough, being pan-European or launching something pan-European does not mean that you turn your, you're turning yourself into a, a mouthpiece for the EU commission. Um, so third point is, can there be life without Google or Facebook money? And I, I, I think this is like, this is, you know, one of the, this is something that we can kind of, you know, bring, mobilize people around, right? It, it, make, it makes sense to try to mobilize people around this issue rather than just sit passively and wait for Google and Google or Facebook to provide, you know, um, uh, media creators with the funds and, and put, bring them into their, you know, uh, into their dependency. Um, the final point is things can take time. So I think that uh, you know, it's, it's probably easy to say this is a transformative decade, you know, how many transformative decades have we had, but these are really, really special times that we've entered. And I, I think that um, precisely because there's so much happening, um, it's going to become increasingly obvious that we need to tell our stories, collect our stories, inform ourselves in a, in a different way across Europe and break out of those silos. Um, the illustration to this slide is is uh, is a is a cover of a book that I really, if you haven't read it, do read it. It's a bit it's a big book, um, and I I put it here because you know how it's been said that journalists are the historians of the present. Well, isn't it striking that the first ever pan-European history book that covered the post nineteen forty five period the first ever such book, and it was written by Tony Judd. Uh, it's a brilliant, it's a masterpiece. It only came out in 2005. That's not that long ago, right? It was the first time that a historian actually said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell the story, the history of Europe. And it's a very human centric uh, history book. Uh, this, this only happened in 2005. So, you know, uh, over, over, um, over 15 years after the Berlin Wall fell, uh, this this kind of made me ponder, you know, it, it also gives me hope because I think that just as it took historians or one historian, you know, that amount of time to produce the book, the, the pan-European history book, I think, I think there, you know, this means that 
just just in the same way for journalists and media uh, people, uh, we will get there. We will we will get to that point where we will be telling our stories, you know, in a in a in a common way. In a not 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 to say that we will all become identical. That's not the point. But we will be creating that space where we can have that information about ourselves um, and 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 the debates that we need. Um, okay. Final final slide before the video is it's it's enough it's uh, you know I hesitated to put this but I wanted us to also applaud the heroes that we have you know um, in journalism across Europe and this is also what the fix has been doing uh, especially on Monday with the the debate on you know with with our friends from Belarus and, and Ukraine but you know let's celebrate the heroes and the, you know um, to two amazing uh, young women journalists in Belarus were imprisoned uh, and sentenced last week to two years in prison just for covering protests. So they, you know, Katsarina Andreeva and Daria Shulzova, I wanted to name them. They are, you know, my special heroes for this talk. And uh, other heroes are the, the reporters on the ground across the continent who are doing their, their job. And it's really difficult. This has been mentioned before. It's really difficult, but I think, you know, because it's difficult and because we're connecting, uh, uh, we're connecting as journalists um, across the continent, which has been, you know, several times the epicenter of the pandemic. I think this is also contributing to our, our awareness of, of needing to work together. Um, Belarus journalists have been an amazing source of information when many uh, legacy Western European or Western full stop journalists or media outlets could no longer or were barred from working in Belarus. It, for me, the, the sort of advent of Belarusian, you know, talented journalism was a really eye opening moment also for people who think about a pan European media space. Um, and so the next slide is me saying thank you and let's debate. And the final, final thing, Yaku, but it's up to you. It's the video. It's, it's, um, it's, it lasts for like a minute or so. And what it is, it's like the, the, the advertising for the European back in 1991. And you'll see, um, it's, it's just a, you know, a bit of comic relief. You'll see why some people kind of joked saying that it, the, the, the European was the newspaper for people who read newspapers with um, sunglasses. 